Coming up today on Studio 13 Live, the SAC Awards were last night. We're taking a look at the biggest moments and the best red carpet look. Then, we're meeting the local kid who performed the national anthem at last night's Kraken game, and he's going to put on a show for us. We're learning how to shuck oysters with Elliot's Oyster House and get a look at their upcoming classes, plus what toppings go best with different oyster varieties. Plus, we're chatting with filmmaker Drew Hawley about his latest documentary featuring the Buffalo Soldiers of Seattle. See how it's now getting recognized nationally. And Seattle chef and restaurateur Ethan Stoll is here to cook up some delicious food. Studio 13 Live starts right now. I wanna see you smile, take you another mile. Don't gotta wait, don't gotta wait, don't gotta wait today. It's happening all around, like sunshine through the clouds. Hey, welcome! Happy Monday. So glad you're here with us today. I'm Carly Henderson. And I am Maria Garcia. And the Studio 13 Live crew went on a bit of an adventure yesterday. We went to drag brunch at the Fairmont Olympic Hotel, and I had the time of my life. It was so fun, and the food was spectacular. So was the performance. Yes. But they did, the food was so good also. The food was incredible. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if all drag brunches are like this, but if they are, I'm going to every single one I can. <laughs> it was so much fun. It was like we had this like wonderful brunch with this huge buffet and so much delicious food. And then like the music was blasting. I felt like I was like in the club a little bit. And I don't go to the club that much these days. And then it was like a concert and like comedy performance and just like the art of all of these incredible drag performers. It was so, it was we, like, it was the we best really day. had a great time. I think we have a picture of the team. Oh, oh, we don't have the picture. Well, you know what? You can find it on our social media. We definitely yeah. posted it up there. You can find Carly or myself on Instagram. We, yeah. we posted all about it. Yes, we did. <laughs> Some fun dancing videos. Check it out. <laughs> all right. Well, actors were honored at the 29th Annual Screen Actors Guild Awards last night. Brendan Fraser won for Best Actor for his role in The Whale. Jason Bateman won for Best Actor for his TV series, Ozark. And Sally Field, who we actually interviewed on our show yeah. just last month received the Lifetime Achievement Award. Well deserved and I feel like we're friends now so we got to root <laughs> for our friend uh, but it was actually the cast of the hit indie movie Everything Everywhere All at Once that swept the categories and made history. They nabbed the biggest award of the night Outstanding Ensemble and stars Michelle Yeoh and Kiwi Kwan were also honored for their roles. Yeo actually became the first Asian actress to win Best Actress and Kwan became the first Asian male film winner. Thank you for giving me a seat at the table because so many of us need this. We want to be seen, we want to be heard, and tonight you have shown us that it is possible. This is a really emotional moment for me. Recently, I was told that if I were to win tonight, I would become the very first Asian actor to win in this category. Oh. Beautiful. So you can just tell how much it meant to them and like to everyone who they're inspiring as they're watching too. And you know, the SAG Awards are the best predictor of who's gonna win an Oscar. And I feel like in a sense sure. it's it's even it's even more beautiful that your fellow actors are the ones that are honoring you. And and you know, those clips we showed you of the speeches were beautiful, but the part that stuck with me the most was when Michelle Yeoh, you know, through tears, said that she was gonna she was grateful, but that her mother would be eternally grateful as well. And I think it said something just really beautiful about the relationship of mothers and their children, especially immigrant mothers and their children and wanting that success for them. Yeah, and you know, like so much of the entertainment industry is smoke and mirrors, right? Actors are told, and, and singers and everyone, you have to get on TikTok to do this, or and so much is like celebrity gossip makes you more famous, and there's like that whole side of it that I think a lot of people probably don't wanna do. They are in it for the art, so an award show like the SAG Awards, I feel like really recognizes that, and I think everyone who won is just so grateful that they didn't give up, because they had so much, so many times I'm sure that they could have. I mean, Michelle Yeoh is 60 years old, Absolutely. so it's really fun to cheer them on and watch that.
Jamie Lee Curtis also won a SAG Award for Best Supporting Actress for her role in, of course, Everything Everywhere All at Once. And she made an emotional speech that included a tribute to her parents, Jane Lee and Tony Curtis, even jokingly calling herself <laughs> a Nepo baby. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, pouring out a bunch of love for acting and films on stage and praising her co-star. She has been her biggest cheerleader for Michelle Yeoh. Oh my goodness, she really <laughs> is. She That was a great speech speech too. I'm also glad that she kind of changed her tune on the whole Nepo baby thing because back in December when this was all, you know, the discussion was being had, the magazine cover came out, um, I, she was, you know, saying this is kind of offensive and it's trying to tear people down whose parents are movie stars. And of course her parents are movie stars. So I'm glad that she just owned it at the SAG Awards because I think that's what we all just wanted all along. No one's trying to tear each other down, but it's just kind of funny. I think it was probably like a knee jerk reaction to feeling offended <laughs> herself or maybe like a little bit triggered by it. But yeah. when you come to terms with it, yeah. it's not too Just bad, own right? It, it's okay, you know? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, of course, we cannot talk about the award shows without talking about style. Yeah, so let's go through some of the looks that we liked and some that we maybe didn't like as much. Uh, my favorite look was Jenna Ortega. Obviously, mm -hmm. she is this year's It Girl with a success of Wednesday. I love the cut of this dress. I love the sparkle. I think it looks, I, I think like the shape of it is so cool. And I like that her hair was a little bit dressed down. It felt very like effortless yeah. style to me. I loved her look. I, I could see that. And I do agree with a lot of what you said and all love to my Latina sister, but <laughs> it's giving trash bag to me. Like the, oh! something, something about the fabric or the way it shines, <laughs> though I do love the shape. Oh, but Maria. It, it looks like she did a really fancy deal with like a glad bag. Oh! That is this, like the shadiest thing you've ever said, <laughs> I think. I love her. That shocked me. Yeah, I just don't love the fabric. <clears throat> That's what it is. Okay. You know? um, let's take a look at Angela Bassett's look because yes. I loved this look as well. This was my favorite look of the night. I loved it. Yes. And, yeah. And you know what it is? A, a little bit uh, selfish here, but the, I did not have that beautiful top portion, but it is the shape of what my dre wedding dress looked like. Oh, so right? I just, I love it. And the color. I'm obsessed with this color this season. Yeah, yeah. I love this color on her. It looks so beautiful. And I love the little fluffiness at the, like, yeah. the top and the bottom too. Fun. It's like, to me, this is like an award show dress. Yeah, I you know? think so. You're going to an award show. You're like, I need an award show dress. Yeah, and th there was a lot of, uh, we're not going to show you everything, but there was a lot of like really wrinkly looking dresses to uh. me as well. I feel like maybe the fabric, yeah. I'm on fabric today. Yeah. It, it didn't all about sit fabric, girl. well. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Austin Butler. He was my favorite dressed male of the night. I really love the interesting shape of the suit and you can never go wrong with like a deep red oxblood colored suit in my opinion. Yeah, it's nice when men switch it up a little bit. Obviously like not as much creativity can go into a, a man's suit as a woman's dress. I feel like we just have so much more fun and so much more we can play with. But he looks fantastic. And I also loved seeing him help uh, Sally Field up on the oh. stage too during that. Such a gentleman. We love Austin a gentleman. Um, let's take a look at Kai Smith because he uh, really <laughs> threw it back. <laughs> To Good Burger! If you were ever a Nickelodeon kid like me, it's just so much fun to look at that. I love a bit, but this <laughs> threw me for a, lo a loop. And all I can hear is, welcome to Good Burger. Oh, you know? Good Burger, can, can I, I take, take your, your order? order? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. Uh, he has an entire TikTok account dedicated to that with 2 million followers. All right. So I'll be watching more of that coming up. We love a bit. All right, and this one... <laughs> We just gave this woman so much well-deserved love, yeah. but Michelle Yeoh's dress. Is mm. this giving French fry? A bunch of French yeah, fries? Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> it's also giving, I might be showing my age a little, but like when you uh, shred paper, Oh, you know, well, it definitely was hitting the microphone during the acceptance speech. And I was thinking back away from the microphone, girl. Mm -hmm. um, my probably worst dressed would go to Julia Garner, someone who's also had a huge year playing oh. Anna Delby. I just feel like there was a lot going on with this dress. Okay. I would see I would love to see a dress of just the top fabric or just the bottom fabric. But to me, it was like the fabrics just didn't. I match up. Yeah, it is is very different. I don't necessarily mind the mix, but those sleeves would have to go for me. It would at least have to be sleeveless. Yeah, I don't know. there's just a lot going yeah. on there. Mm -hmm. um, someone else who has a lot going on, 
Harry Styles. So we just found out he's actually going to have to participate in the 2023 New Zealand census since he actually has a concert there that night. The census happens every five years in New Zealand and everyone, including overseas visitors, are required to participate. The New Zealand census Twitter account confirmed the news, writing, even former members of One Direction will have to participate. <laughs> Styles is going to have to answer questions about household members, gender identity, and income. But don't get too excited because his answers will stay confidential. Huh. I'm sure it's not going to be Harry Styles himself filling out the little form. Can you imagine with like a tiny pencil? There's no <laughs> way. He's having his manager, his assistant, somebody else is doing that. But yeah. that sounds fun. It's interesting you know. to me that visitors have to participate too because the census, at least in the States, is usually used to decide funding yeah. for, you know, projects or to see what communities in particular need, Why? which is why it's so important to do it. But yeah. A visitor. I know. Interesting. I guess they, maybe New Zealand's a little bit of a smaller country, so they just <laughs> want to count everyone, include everyone. All right. Well, we have been talking about this fella on the show on and off. We're talking Nick Cannon. And in recent years, the amount of babies <laughs> that he has helped create uh, really have been a bit that people poke fun at. You know, he has 12 kids from six different moms. All of them under 11 years old, and now he's speaking out about this one. So Cannon says that he actually takes fatherhood very seriously, and when asked if he is done having children, he said, quote, God decides when we're done. Mm. Okay, and Cannon admitted that he has his handful, certainly, uh, but said that, quote, he, he knows... Uh, what and uh, when he's 85, he could potentially have another baby. The man does not want to stop. And a report last year suggested that he actually pays nearly $3 million a year in child support, though he says that he definitely spends a lot more than that on his children every year. I mean, at this point, it's just like a hobby, I know, right? It's a very Creating more humans. Yeah, it is It is very interesting. And, you know, it's it's a... I would love to ask him about his choice to procreate with several different women and all these women seem to be aware, clear of what's going on. I mean, I can certainly say that would never work for me, but yeah. it seems to be working for him. It seems to be working for them. I, t I think just the thinking of the amount of quality time you would get with your dad, if you had 11 siblings, certainly people do this sometimes, but I was one of four kids and I feel like it was like challenging at times in different phases of life to get quality time with my parents. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a lot. And also just being like, oh, God will decide when we're done. Like God did, get, did give us technology and brains <laughs> and like ways to stop it. So, I mean, I feel like you're just saying it's going to keep happening. Yeah. But to your point, <laughs> I do think that, uh, you know, at least for me presently as a parent, it is definitely something I think about. I mean, I can honestly say that trying to balance career, a little time to myself, time to focus on my marriage and time to focus on my son. It, it feels like a house of cards. Totally. On the daily. And you have one child. <laughs> yeah, just the one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Add 11 more in and oh <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> well, coming up next, TMZ is joining us with your top entertainment headlines. Jennifer Coolidge making an emotional acceptance speech at the SAG Awards. All those details coming up. Take a look at what is popping in celebrity news. And for that, we are bringing in our man, Fabian Garcia from TMZ. Hey, Fabian. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's always great to see you. Uh, let's talk about Jennifer Coolidge because she just won outstanding performance by a female actor for White Lotus last night. And she had a really tearful acceptance speech at the SAG Awards. Fill us in on that. Yeah, Jennifer Coolidge has a way with words lately at award shows, and this was no different. Uh, she told the story about how she sort of fell in love with acting. That was kind of the whole theme theme of the night because SAG is Screen Actors Guild Award. It's the Actors Award, actors voting for other actors. And she told the story about how when she was in first grade, uh, her dad pulled her out of school one day on a lie, telling the principal, oh, she's sick, we got to take her to the doctor. Instead, he took her to some kind of Charlie Chaplin film festival, which she says served as the inspiration for her to get into acting and to pursue this career. So just a really sweet, touching moment. Um, obviously, Jennifer Coolidge is widely beloved right now because of White Lotus. Uh, she's the toast of the town. I'm a little interested to see how she rides this wave, especially now that her character is being killed off in the show. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, shame <laughs> on you. 
Uh, but we'll see. I mean, people love them, Jennifer Coolidge, and I'm sure she's lined up to get a lot of work now. Definitely. And I feel like we've all been rooting for her for so long. She's in so many of our favorite projects. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm really excited to see what she's going to do next. Uh, yes. Let's talk about Christina Applegate. She was also a standout at the SAG Awards, not just because of her nomination, but also because of her courage. Fill us in on that. Yeah, so obviously she has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I think a couple years back that diagnosis came down, um, and she's been battling it publicly since then, bravely, I should say, including at the SAG Awards last night. Uh, she attended the award show. She said this might, in fact, be her last award show that she'll go to in person because her disease is getting so debilitating and bad. And you got to see that with her uh, walking with the cane. She had a message, though, on the cane. The letters uh, that were inscribed were F-U-M-S, kind of giving the middle finger to her disease there. So good for her for being brave and, and kind of doing that. Um, and it's just heartbreaking because Christina Applegate is a national treasure, obviously. So good in her show, uh, Dead to Me. Um, and, you know, she was actually nominated, didn't win. But it was good, good of her to get out there. Um, and it's, I, we hope we can, she can continue working because, again, she's talented. And uh, it's just a really sad chapter in her life right now. Absolutely, yeah. Oh my gosh, I need to watch the newest season of Dead to Me too. Did you watch yeah, the latest one? It, it, I have not seen it yet, I'm behind, but yeah. apparently the word around here is that it's really good, worthy of the nomination, and might have even been worthy of the win. Oh my gosh, love her. She is a national yeah. treasure. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Of course, my pleasure, happy to be here. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Coming up, Elliot's Oyster House is joining us in studio. Maria is gonna be learning how to properly shuck oysters, and we're gonna get a look at their upcoming classes right after the break. Hello, and welcome back. Elliot's Oyster House has been an award-winning classic Seattle seafood house for almost 50 years, featuring over 24 varieties of oysters, and Wintertime, really a great time to eat them right up. And today I am joined by Chef Robert Spaulding, who's going to teach us all about shucking. Welcome. Thank you, Maria. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to talk about oysters and our shucking class coming up. Uh, I think there is another one on April 18th and March, I'm sorry, March 5th, March 18th and April 15th. Yes, yes. And at those, we are going to teach all about shucking oysters, a little, little bit about oyster history, oyster tools, where to get oysters, and what to drink with oysters. Beautiful, now tell us a little bit about Elliot's Oyster House and how you source those different ingredients. Sure, Elliot's has been there for about 50 years and beginning in 1975, our relationship started developing with local growers. Growers like Hamahama Shellfish, Westcott, Pen Cove Shellfish, Taylor Shellfish, we've had those relationships for almost 50 years now. And as one of the best oyster bars and one of the largest oyster bars on the West Coast, we look for relationships and people, oyster growers, come to us to feature their oysters on our bar. So, Beautiful. Um, we generally have access to the largest selection of oysters on the West Coast. And sometimes, uh, argue, argue, you know, arguably, maybe in the nation. So. Beautiful, that is so exciting. So here's the thing. I'm a big fan of an oyster, but I'm also very afraid of shucking them myself. So you'll see me, you know, at an establishment like yours often, but I would sure. love to learn. Will you teach me? Absolutely, yes. Oysters, uh, it's really not intimidating once you get used to it. Okay. Oysters have a hinge right here, and there are several different ways to shuck oysters, but here on the West Coast, we usually go in through the hinge because they're a smaller oyster. And the tool that we like to use for that is the shorter oyster knife like that. Um, lots of other oyster knives yeah. for different regions and maybe some bad ideas. We don't want to use a screwdriver <laughs> or a chisel or an ice pick Okay, or I like love that. this. Can we get a shot of this right here? <laughs> the bad idea, my friends. Don't use a screwdriver. Okay. <laughs> but so, we do have the tools we need right here. Yes, and you want to start out with a smaller oyster knife like this. Mm -hmm. Put the oyster on a towel so it doesn't slip. Mm -hmm. We'll give you that. <gasps> You're going to give me the easy peasy one. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. And we put the knife right into the hinge. And I set the, it down on the towel, right? Yep, set it down okay. on the towel and uh, put your hand a little bit back. Okay. And then you just kind of apply a little bit of pressure just until the tip of the knife pops into the hinge. Am I doing it? Am you are. Doing yep, it. That's okay. perfect. Okay. And as soon as you feel it loosen up a little bit, <laughs> 
I'm not that strong, chef. Oh, wait, I think I felt something. Not a lot of muscles required. You no? Got there you go. Okay. Now give it a little twist counterclockwise. Let's see. There, there she is. All right, now Perfect. a little twist. Oh, <gasps> I did it! All I really right. was afraid it was not gonna happen, friends. Then at this point, we can just slide the knife along the right side of the oyster. The right side. And that's gonna separate the adductor muscle. Ooh, I got stuck here. That's the adductor muscle if you just oh. keep kind of gently going forward. Perfect. Yay! There you go. Then, so that it'll come out of the shell into your mouth, mm -hmm. you slip the knife under it and pull it towards you gently. Okay. All righty. And then, just to make sure, flip it over. Okay. I think we have a part-time job for you. <gasps> Ooh, I will be your <laughs> slowest oyster shucker. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't know how to shuck an oyster until I started working at Elliot's. Uh, I thought I did, but a couple of happy hours and, and I, was, I was done. Awesome, all right. Now, so, what do we do now? Now, you could choose to put mignonette on it. We use a frozen mignonette Ooh. because it sits on top of the oyster and doesn't displace the nectar, so mm -hmm. you get all of the mignonette and all of the nectar. Yeah, awesome, right here. There if you want to this try is it. so fun. I've never tried frozen mignonette. Beautiful. Now, uh, some people like cocktail sauce. Is there really a wrong way to do this? There's not. The, the main thing is to have fun. Um, awesome. People get uh, really attached to the way they ate oysters when they grew up. Uh -huh. Hot sauce, crackers, it doesn't matter as long as you're eating oysters and having fun. That is amazing. Now tell me a little bit about what people can learn in your classes. Sure, so we talk a little bit about the history. Uh, I did a class once and talked a lot about history and started geeking out about oysters and people's eyes started rolling back <laughs> in their head. So we're gonna talk a little bit about oysters, uh, but more so where to get oysters, how to source them, whether or not they're good when you're, when you're what to look for as far as sourcing oysters. And okay. then typically uh, more about what tools to use, what tools not to use, how to open oysters, and then we do a little sh speed shucking competition at the end. Myself, my alter ego, Shuck Norris. <laughs> Shuck and Norris. and uh, a couple of folks from the restaurant. I won the last one. Um, Just a little, a little dig there, I love it, yeah, <laughs> okay. A little, little dig for the, for the staff, just to, we're all gonna go to the West Coast Shucking Championship. We talk about that oyster events around town, our oyster event, which is called uh, Oyster New Year, where we uh, donate proceeds to the Puget Sound Restoration Fund. Oh. And it's, it's, it's a really good time. A lot about uh, oysters and, and what to drink with them. All oysters. right, I'm gonna try this, okay? Is that all right? Sure. All right, let's try see. Try one with you here. Mmm, that is delicious. Ooh, I gotta eat more of these guys, but before I do that, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate thank you, you teaching me. Yes, you can check out their oyster shucking classes March 18th and April 15th. We do have more info on our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio 13 live. All right, coming up next, a 13-year-old local singer-songwriter is taking the big stage. Nikhil Baga is stopping by to tell us about performing during last night's Kraken game. And he's also playing for us. The way I am fully impressed here, okay? Born in Toronto, but based in Seattle, 13-year-old Nikhil Baga performed the Canadian and the U.S. National Anthems during last night's Kraken game on that guitar. Yep, he first started playing at nine years old, and now, a few years later, he's already releasing music of his own, and he joins us now in studio. Hi! Hi. <laughs> you are so great at what you do. Yes. For someone of any age, what did it feel like performing the National Anthem in front of all those people? It was great. Um, yeah, it's it's awesome just to see everyone and being able to represent both of my countries. And yeah, I'm glad that I <laughs> that I got the opportunity. Yeah. To. 
Yeah. Uh, it is a wonderful opportunity, but we have to know, what is your favorite part about performing? Um, that's a hard one. I think just feeding off the crowd and just making sure that they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I'm happy that everyone enjoyed it. Um, that's like the best part for me because it's just, it's what makes me happy. And that's why I love oh. music. Well, it seems like you're meant for this. It's your destiny. <laughs> I know you first picked up the guitar at age nine. Yeah. What kind of, what was the catalyst for that? What made you want to pick up that guitar? So I started playing piano when I was in like preschool. Oh. <laughs> so I've been playing piano for the longest time and I eventually quit. And the rule in the house is we had to play an instrument. So ah. I chose guitar, so. And my parents didn't think that I'd stick with it, so they bought me like a cheap guitar off Amazon. <laughs> and then I just kind of gradually started learning and yeah. And now look at you. Your dad was saying you know hundreds of songs. <laughs> How many songs do you think you know? Uh, I don't know. Like 300? <laughs> Something like it's that. It's a, a lot. <gasps> it's very impressive. And, and we love a guy that shows people what's up when he finds <laughs> something that he loves. So you have to tell us, what's your favorite performance so far? Uh, that's hard. Um, <laughs> Maybe this one. Oh, yeah! yeah. yeah. I Good like answer, that. my friend. <laughs> what about, like, standing in front of all those people, I feel like anyone would get yes. nervous. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get nervous? And do you get nervous? Um, yeah, I get nervous a little bit, but, I mean, all in all, you just kind of have to go through it and, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. push through. Perform yeah. for, for the art, yeah. right? Yeah. So we would love to hear about your new single, Sorry Not Sorry, because you are both a singer, a musician and a songwriter. Yeah. Tell us all about that. So yeah, this song um, is about not being able to trust someone fully. You never know what they like mean, and sorry doesn't cut it. So beautiful. Yeah. All right, and nice. you're gonna perform this for yeah. us, right? All right, well, let's take it away. Sorry, not sorry It's you again calling I run and I'm falling I hide and you're watching
thank you so much for stopping by. You're so thank great you. at what you do. Yeah. Oh, we put a link to his music up on fox13seattle.com slash studio 13 live. I felt that. Me I felt too. It. Oh Me my too. goodness. Congratulations <laughs> on being so talented. <laughs> yeah. Truly. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for visiting with us. And coming up, we are also chatting with a local filmmaker, Drew Holly. Yeah, we're going to see how his documentary is honoring the Buffalo Soldiers of Seattle and how it's going to be recognized on a national level right after the break. It's happening all around. In honor of Black History Month, we are featuring the amazing people, organizations, and Black-owned businesses in our area. The documentary, Buffalo Soldiers, Fighting on Two Fronts, based on the Buffalo Soldiers of Seattle, being recognized nationally. Yeah, and today we are joined by Washington-based filmmaker Drew Holly to hear all about it. Hey, Drew. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good Welcome to the show. So for those who don't know, tell us about the Buffalo Soldiers of Seattle and what inspired you to make this film? So the film is actually a historical film about the Buffalo Soldiers uh, that were created by Congress right after the Civil War in 1866. And there was a nickname given to them due to their participation in the Indian Wars. The Buffalo, Se uh, Buffalo Soldiers of Seattle is actually the group that inspired me to make this film. So this is a one hour documentary. It features interviews, reenactments, animations. What was the process of making this film like and how long did it take you? The process was treacherous and it was a long journey. It took four and a half years to make this project. Yeah. That has to feel so good to kind of be see it, seeing it come to fruition at this point. Any kind of memorable stories from set or any particular moments that really stuck with you during the interviews? I think uh, during the interviews, of course, they were all significant. But I think this, what stuck with me the most is the, the journey it took to, to make this project and the, the origins of this project. Uh, volunteering at the Langston Hughes Juneteenth Festival back in 2018, I was uh, capturing footage to help them promote their next year's festival. While I was there, I brought my daughter with me, who was six at the time. Uh, while I was getting footage, she was checking out the festival, and after a while, I heard her say, ooh, horsies. <laughs> and when I looked up from my camera, I seen something that I hadn't seen before, and it was an all-black regiment straight out of the 19th century galloping up the hill on horseback. And my daughter asked me, she said, who are they, Daddy? And I was honestly stumped. I could not think of who these, who these men were. And after a while, I think it dawned on me, I must have remembered the Bob Marley song, Buffalo Soldiers. And I said, I think these are the Buffalo Soldiers. But I was a little saddened that she had forgotten this history and also that, that I had forgotten the history and that she probably never was going to be taught it. So being the filmmaker that I, was, that I am, uh, I decided to take on this this project. It is beautiful to see what our children can inspire in us, uh, oftentimes. Uh, and this project deals a lot with the complexities of race, class, power, colonialism. Talk to us about that and the message that you want the audience to take away from this. I feel honored to be able to share the story of uh, American black soldiers with the world through this film. Uh, I, I hope audience will take away a greater understanding of what these men and women have done to build this country and raise themselves up against immense barriers at home and abroad. For sure. And I, I know this it's just been announced that the film's going to air nationally on Juneteenth, which is huge. Tell us about that and kind of what it means to you to have this story shared on a national level. I feel honored to be able to share this story, uh, this film, uh, to, our, to the world. Um, and having been selected as one of PBS Open Call is, is actually a dream come true. I never had, th that is where I wanted the film to go. Uh, the film is an educational film, but I hope it is going to be inspiring and entertaining as well to watch. So. It is it's so poetic that I started this project 2018, Juneteenth, and now for it to be nationally broadcast 2023, Juneteenth, five years later, is, is, is beautiful. 
Talk to us a little bit about what it means to be part of the effort of making sure that history is not forgotten, that important moments like this, especially for the black community, are front and center in people's minds. You know, every February, and I feel that this is American history. It doesn't just fit into one month, right? This is a history that the reason why the Buffalo Soldiers expanded us and the reason why we're in the West. They built the infrastructure to the reason why we're here today. Um, our history doesn't just fit into one month. We live it every day. For sure. Is there anything else you want to add before we let you go? I want to say that we will be at the Kennedy Center and uh, the Kennedy School in Portland today, and we'll be back up in the Puget Sound um, on the 1st at the Puget Sound University. Beautiful. Puget University. Thank Come you so much. Come on out and check us out. It's a great thing to do, and thank you so much for joining us today. Buffalo Soldiers Fighting on Two Fronts will be coming to PBS and World Channel this June. We do have a link set up for you with more information on our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio13 live. Yeah, great chat with him, too. It was. I think it was really exciting to be able to get this particular focus on this I know. Film. It's like you never know. Sometimes it takes your kid asking you a question, and that sets you off on a whole other path, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, still ahead, restaurateur Ethan Stoll is here to talk about new restaurants opening. And he's going to be making us some delicious cacio e pepe. We'll cacio be right back. Cacio e pepe! <laughs> <laughs> It is time for Emerald Eats, where we get to highlight amazing food in our area. Oof, and today we are joined by Chef Ethan Stoll with CEO and founder of Ethan Stoll Restaurants. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have several restaurants. Tell us about them. Yeah, we've got a bunch. We've got a bunch. We've been around for a long time. Um, um, you know, we mostly focus on neighborhood restaurants where people can go and, you know, get to know regulars and and uh, really enjoy uh, getting involved in those neighborhoods, whether it's, you know, participating in a school auction or just doing stuff in the community. You know, so, you know, most of our restaurants are in neighborhoods. We've got a few downtown. We've got Cortina and Goldfinch. Uh, but, yeah, you know, we're fun, and it's been fun, and it's uh, been, a, been a great run, and we're looking forward to the next as many years as we got. Yeah, yeah very good. successful. <laughs> and what are we cooking today? Well, today, you know, I mean, a lot of our restaurants are Italian. Yeah. So we wanted to do a classic Italian dish. This is actually a Roman pasta dish called cacio e pepe. Cacio e pepe. You, you have Carly to, you really have to do this. to put the sauce on it, you I know. know. It, well, you said you like it, but you you don't know how to make it. Right. Correct. That's true. Okay, so I've never yeah. even attempted making this. Let's teach you how to make it then. How about? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So first off, we're gonna do. We got our pasta cooking here, and this one, you know, I did a, you know, a classic spaghetti. Mm -hmm. You know, in Rome, you know, you may find like a tonarelli, you may find a, you know, a short rigatoni called a mezze manique. Um, there's a lot of different variables you can do, and, and you know, bucatini is another one you could do. Mm -hmm. But this one is, uh, we're just doing a nice, uh, great spaghetti. I use dry spaghetti because I want people to be able to cook it at home. Yep. Yep. So first off, we're gonna do. We got the pasta cooking. It's coming out in about a minute. Okay. We're gonna add a little grass-fed butter here. Is that right. the trick? And butter. Butter. <laughs> butter. Butter is definitely one. And I know you're all about you know making this Italian cuisine with Pacific Northwest ingredients. Why is that important to you? Well, I think uh, I think just you know having the combination of Italian culture and Italian food mixed with the stuff we have out here is amazing. Yeah. Whether it's salmon, scallops, oysters, crab, clams, wild mushrooms, wow. all those things work out really well. Yeah. And just, it's more the style of, of uh, Italian food that we love. Their, you know, their sensibility of food is, is amazing. Yeah. So they keep it casual. Yeah. And they keep it fun. Ooh, okay. it's bubbling. So we got it bubbling. So first off, who wants to crack the pepper in there? Sure. Yeah. I'll crack You're going to have to crack a lot of pepper. Just okay. Ooh. <laughs> Be generous. Okay, so cacio so, pepe. Oops. Cacio e pepe is a, a, a cheese and black pepper okay. sauce, and you add a little bit of the pasta cooking water. Should I stop yet, or I'm still no, going? no, no? You gotta oh do a lot. God. You gotta do a lot. Is if your get, wrist you get, okay? You gotta like, do a lot. If, if, if you get tired, I'll take it over. I feel I'll, like this could have been one of the dances at the drag let me, show yesterday. Let me show yesterday. you a, a trick on on, on, on back, black pepper okay. cracking. Okay. For one, you have to have a good pepper mill. I love I love Pujo right. pepper mills. Yeah. They're super great. And just oh. keep on spinning it. Ooh. Oh. Like you gotta have That's a lot of this stuff. force there. Yes. Yep. Wow. And we're gonna do a lot of this stuff. That is a lot. A lot now, of do you like it better this way and not just in like that little white box that I buy at the grocery store? What, pepper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I believe there's a huge difference between the freshly cracked pepper mm -hmm. and, um, and pre ground stuff. Okay. You know, I can so certainly smell it. You can smell it, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so wow. you can see in there, this is, you can tell it has a ton of pepper in it. And that's good, that's what we want, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I just we're gonna... realized I got fired from my pepper crack. You did not get fired. <laughs> you did not get fired, you're doing great. He's like, I'll take it over. <laughs> and then we're gonna take a big helping of our spaghetti, mix it in there. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, and don't worry, you're in, you're in charge of cheese, and you're probably gonna get fired Ooh, from that too. Duty, baby, you're ready, girl. <laughs> okay. Hope you can shred fast. I don't know. Okay, let's get this right here in front of you. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna put that down so it doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. uh, burn anything. Slip. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. Here we go. Get to work. Is there friend. like a way? An uh, angle? Either way. Yeah. I usually this is how I usually do it. Just so you okay. have good good pressure on it. You want to really. Ooh. But watch your fingers. Yes. That is, I, <laughs> today I feel like Maria's fingers have been in danger all yeah. day. But I've been be okay. Be careful with those little fingers. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. <laughs> is it this whole, it's not this whole block, is it? No, no, no. Oh, we're going to okay. put a fair amount in and then we're going to put some on top. Now the key to cacio e pepe <laughs> is really getting a little bit of the pasta water in and then and then stirring it in so it gets Ooh. creamy so the cheese emulsifies in the pasta cooking liquid. I think that's good for it there. Woo! What does the pasta water do instead of like another liquid that you could use? There's, well... It, it traditionally it's a little bit of pasta water for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. One is that usually in, in restaurants they keep the pasta water going, so they have baskets to go in, so all the pasta water gets a little bit more thick with semolina mm -hmm. flour coming off, so it helps emulsify. Mm -hmm. If you know what a roux is, it's a combination of butter and, and flour to make a thickener. Mm -hmm. Pasta water is just like that, but so much thinner, so it just gives it a little bit of uh, it gives it a little bit of thickening agent to the sauce. Wow, beautiful! And this is this is the kind of the key you got to kind of. You kind of got to know when you're making it what the correct amount of water is. Because mm. you're, you're trying to make like a basically a, a cheese sauce uh, out of the pasta water, the butter, and the, and the cheese. Okay. Now, does this have egg in it or not? This has no egg in oh, it. Oh, I thought it did for some reason. Nope, nope, that's carbonara. <laughs> that, so uh, That's part of what I've been doing wrong. For... <laughs> She's been <laughs> adding <laughs> eggs to it. <laughs> yeah, the, the most famous pasta dish out of Rome <coughs> is carbonara. So that's, oh. from, that's from Rome. Uh. And this is, I would say, the second most famous pasta dish out of Rome. Cacio e pepe. And then they've got one called a matriana, which is um, guanciale, tomato sauce, red mm. onions, things like that. Ooh, so, yum. Good. Now, Beautiful. who wants to taste it a little bit and make sure it has enough salt? Ooh. We'll, sure, we I'll do it. I like it. a lot of salt, though, I'll warn you. Just taste the sauce on the, on the end. Oh, just... And what, you're gonna, you're like gonna get a fork? Whole, yeah, just lick oh. the fork and see if the fork has enough salt in it. <laughs> more it salt. More, more salt. Yeah. Ooh, beautiful. Yeah. I'm gonna add a little pepper too. Do it. Yeah, do you want to salt bay it? I'll salt, salt bay. Yeah, salt yeah. bay. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do? You're supposed to just drop it off your off, There you go, close enough. <laughs> Did I do it? <laughs> you're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, so you want to do water a little bit at a time so a little we don't bit of time. drown it. Okay. All so right. you don't drown it, you want to make sure you have the correct amount because it will get absorbed by the, by the pasta a little bit. Right. The thing with these simple dishes is that they're so delicious, but to me, they're so easy to mess up because you do need some patience. Yeah, you need some patience, and there's a little bit of technique involved in it, for sure. It's about practice. I mean, that's the thing for me about cooking is people think that, that there's like some magic gift the chefs have. Mm -hmm. You know what it is? It's just repetition. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of practice, a lot of doing the same thing multiple times, really getting good muscle memory down on dishes, wow. and, and making a lot of mistakes. Do you taste <laughs> as you go a lot? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. That's awesome. And you have locations in Spokane and New York City, right? We have a couple of restaurants in Spokane. One, we have a tavolata out there. And we've got a food hall called the Wonder Market, which is uh, both of those are super fun. And then in New York, we have a partnership restaurant with Nordstrom. Oh, cool. They're from Seattle. Uh, it's called Wolf, and, and it's in their flagship store. It's That's super awesome. Fun to yeah. Empire. So exciting. And you're opening some new restaurants as well. Tell us about that. We are opening some new stuff. We've got one uh, coming in the new convention center. Which is, has anybody been, have you toured that building yet? Not yet. Not yet. We're oh, you need excited to go. It's though. a super cool building. And then uh, we've got a couple opening in, uh, in Redmond. Oh, and then cool. a couple coming later in Woodenville. But yeah, we always stay Very busy. Very exciting. So. And while you're adding that beautiful cheese on there, you <laughs> have to tell us about your philanthropy. Talk to me about a project that you have coming up. Oh, well, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, at ESR, we tend to want to get involved in the community, want to do things. And this March is uh, endometriosis. We're doing a fundraiser at the, CA at the three Seattle Tavoladas. We're doing special uh, endometriosis friendly menus mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the proceeds from that are all going to uh, raise awareness. So That's beautiful, what a great thing to do. Yeah, yeah it's good. Um, I hear you're also a consulting chef for the Mariners. Uh, I am, I am. Yeah. <laughs> the man is We can thank you for busy. the good food there. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've been working uh, together for a long time. The team now at the Mariners is great. 
we've all been together for you know 12 13 years now doing it and the food keeps on getting better and the team is looking awesome yeah, yeah. so maybe uh, because this year should be super exciting <laughs> it'll be super fun so who, great. Who's Can taking bites of this? I think we both are. Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Let's you know. give it a go. Ooh, I love all I got, this I got some cheese all over the place. So pretty. We put our, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into this pasta here, <laughs> didn't we? A little bit. <laughs> this is going to get messy, I can I tell. Yeah. Mm. Tastes like cacio pepe? Mm-hmm. Mm. Very good. The cheesiness, the, the pepper. <laughs> flawless. So good. Thank Yum. you so much for teaching us this. Yeah, oh, I no, feel like sure, no worries. Just keep going. Just add a little bit of the pasta water. What are some other things people do wrong in the kitchen that there's, like, easy tips that you as a chef <laughs> have to offer for? Us? I mean, I can, well, there's there's a few easy ones. I mean, we can do a whole other show in this. Uh, <laughs> Give it to us in, like, 30 seconds. Yeah, there's, there's, it's mostly that people want it done right the first time. Yeah, right. And right. it just takes practice. Yeah. It does. Don't you be know, afraid to, like, revise yeah. your recipes. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and just know that, like, you know, People say, oh, how does my steak turn out so nicely at your restaurants, Ethan? It's like, well, because I've, I've cooked 10,000 yeah. steaks. So if I'm not better at it than you are at this point, i got a problem in my career. Right. Right? You know, so, I mean, I try to make sure that people, you know, uh, uh, don't get negative, don't get down on themselves. Yeah. Stay positive, stay encouraged, and just know that it's practice that really works. Get up and keep trying. Oh. That's Ethan right. Stoll, thank you so much. We posted the recipe on our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio13live. Bye. 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 Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.